Okay, a couple of minutes now. Uh, good morning, everybody, and we're now on our fourth talk with Dr. Dennis O'Keefe on hereditary blood coagulation disorders. Dr. O'Keefe is currently a consultant hematologist in the University Hospital Limerick. He's also joint chair of VTE Ireland. I'd like to welcome you. Thanks a million, Dr. O'Keefe, for doing this talk for us, and off you go. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Delighted to uh, go ahead and to present this morning. Um, I've been asked to talk about inherited risk factors and I'll, I'll put my cards on the table straight away and say particularly in thrombosis, inherited risk factors, they're important in terms of uh, for in certain families as to why clots happen. But the truth is that in terms of testing and in terms of helping people to understand why they get a clot, it, they're not actually very helpful, as you'll see as I go through the talk. So in fact, I've spent much of my career over the last 10 or 15 years basically saying to people, don't test inherited risk factors. And that's because in my experience, they've often caused a whole lot of trouble for families and, and relatives without actually being especially helpful. So I'll take you through the talk, but that's a very important point to take it, to make at the beginning and I'll make it once again at the end. So I'm just going to take you through what I'm going to talk about. So just like many of the speakers, a quick little bit about DVTs and PEs, a little bit about why clots happen and, and, and the interaction between inherited and acquired factors. And then we'll get into the meat of the talk in terms of inherited risk factors. If you do get tested, what exactly are you going to get tested for and what exactly does it, you know, does it mean? And the final part will be, well, OK, when should you get tested or where, when should you think about testing being done? So we all know VT is a huge problem right across the world and the numbers are huge. These are the North American numbers and of course in Ireland it's a huge uh, issue as well as we all know. So I won't go into it more significantly but just the fact that VTE is a big problem across the country. What's the problem? Clots. So what is a clot? Well a clot is the interaction between platelets and fibrin and basically you have two key systems. You've got the platelets which exist in your blood and the interaction between fibrin which suddenly goes from being liquid to solid and of course this is a really important protection mechanism for you. So if you go and you cut your finger off tonight it's the clot forming that will save you in terms of blood loss. But the problem with clots is that in some people whether it's inherited or acquired factors, the clot forms when you don't want it to form. And that's what a DVT and a PE is. It's clot forming specifically in the venous system in your veins when you don't want them to happen. And this may be for a very obvious reason, such as you've broken your leg, or it may be completely out of the blue, as unfortunately some of our patients um, will realize and have experienced. So in every one of us, there's a balance between coagulation and stopping coagulation. So all of us want to coagulate and form a clot when we cut our finger or trauma or surgery, but we don't want to have a clot when we're well and fit or even if we just break a leg or have surgery um, in a DVT or a PE. So all of us have a balance and that balance is dictated by two key factors, genetics, and the environment and what's happening to you. So we know a venous thrombosis is basically where the system goes wrong. So you see the top picture there, you can see that there's a person whose leg is becoming swollen. And what's happening within the vein is that you get a clot formation. And basically what you see is that you get inappropriate formation of the clot, which causes trouble. Firstly, it causes the leg to be swollen and painful. And of course, this tells so the person that something's gone wrong. But of course, if it extends, that becomes more severe, more painful, more swollen. And in the worst case scenario, it breaks off and it shoots up into the, into the lung. And so it begins down in the leg, as anybody who's experienced a DVT in the leg knows. It can be more minor below the knee or more significant as it moves up into the uh, deep femoral or external iliac veins. And the problem as it moves up is the fact that 
the risk of it shooting off to cause a PE becomes greater. And this is the old pulmonary emboli highway. And this is the great risk, the life threatening risk for people who have DVTs. And this really is the, the most uh, dangerous scenario for people who. So why? Why do you get a clot forming when you don't want it to form in the leg? And many years ago, back in the 19th century, it was Virco who identified the combination. Blood flow is stopping, you get injury to the tissues and you get the clotting system getting higher. So you can see in some people, if they have a bad road traffic accident, the damage, let's say, to a very badly fractured leg is very obvious. So they have a damaged trauma with lots of tissue being damaged. They're stuck in a bed, so their circulation is, 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 is slowed down. And then you get the clotting system hugely increased because they've lots of trauma and tissue damage. So you can see very obvious reasons why a person in a bad road traffic accident might have a DVT and a PE. But the question is, why would somebody with no accident or no surgery have a, a, a DVT or a PE? Now, there's other obvious risk factors. Unfortunately, we're all getting older and you know, that's a risk factor independent of everything else as you get older. And this is due to tissue change, your coagulation system. If you're a fella, like most things in life, fellas suffer more. And so the fellas have more clots and higher risk. Hospitalization itself is a risk factor. And then you have the other factors such as cancer, immobilization, drugs, pregnancy, etc. So these are all environmental risk factors, some of which we can do something about, some of which we can't do something about. So these have been well described for many, many years. But what about the meat of the talk, the inherited risk factors? And here we're really talking about what we call thrombophilia testing. And this consists of these tests that you see in the top five lines. So you've got antithrombin deficiency, protein C, protein S, and then factor five light and the prothrombin gene mutation. So these are the, 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 the crux of the test that we send for if we believe looking for an inherited risk factors would be important for you or equally important perhaps for your family and particularly for your kids and daughters as I'll talk about. So if you look at why somebody gets a clot, it, it begins with your inherited risk factor and that puts you at a certain level of risk. And there, there are obviously some people who have very powerful family histories whose genetic risk factors are very powerful. Then you have your age, which you can't change, unfortunately, at the moment. And then potentially you have other factors such as trauma, surgery, cancer that comes along. And what happens is that when you hit the top of this pyramid, you get a clot. And in most people, it's a combination of these three key factors that decides whether you're going to have a clot or whether you're not going to have a clot. So getting into the meat of inherited risk factors, the 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 key to remember is, is that I'm going to talk about firstly what are the at the inherited risk factor, which is the most powerful risk factor that you can inherit. But equally important is to remember that this risk factor is also one of the most rare. So it's extremely rare and that's antithrombin. So if you look at the clotting system and no clotting specialist likes to give a talk to anybody without showing the old clotting system. And so what you see is that you see in the in the gray green here, the key factors that cause your your clot to form. You see right at the end fibrin clot. So all of these factors play together to cause your clot. But then you have the purple and red factors whose job it is to stop the clot. So you can see there's a there's a battle that goes on in all of us in the balance between to form a clot or to not form a clot. But if you asked any of us, what's the key step that decides whether a clot is going to happen? It's in the red here, the antithrombin. The thrombin antithrombin decides if that balance is skewed, then potentially you'll either clot too much or you'll bleed too much. So if you have a deficiency of antithrombin, in general, you have a very powerful risk of having a clot and any family with antithrombin deficiency generally, what you'll see is going right the way back generations, you'll see people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who have DVTs and PEs 
out of the blue or in particular associated with things like pregnancy and other risk factors. So antithrombin deficiency is probably the most powerful inherited risk factor for a person to have clots. But the key thing to remember is it's very rare. So if you took 100 people who have a clot out of the blue, no obvious reason, no injury, no cancer, etc., only one in 100 will have an antithrombin deficiency. So it's incredibly rare. And I'll come back to that in terms of when you should test it. What about the other two very significant risk factors, protein C and protein S deficiency? And I'll just show you why these are important. So these are over here. They basically stop the 8 and 5 from being activated or reduce it. And so they work together. They're a team and together they reduce down the chance of a clot forming. So you can understand if you begin to have a deficiency of the protein S and protein C, then your clotting system is shifted towards forming a clot. Now, the thing to remember about protein S and protein C deficiency is that its impact is highly, highly variable. So I could take two people in my clinic this week and one would have the exact same level of protein C deficiency as the other person, but yet that person would have a brother, sister, mom, dad, a whole number of relatives who have had a clot. And the next person with the exact same level will have no other relative with a clot. And what this tells you is that even with this strong risk factor of a lack of protein S or protein C deficiency, there's huge variation in terms of how this affects your risk of having a clot. And so the key question is, what's the family history? So testing can be helpful, the level can be helpful, but what's the most important question I ask? What is the family history? Because the impact of the gene is more important than a, a level we test in the lab. And once again, it's important to say that these are rare causes of a clot. Just 2% of cases of unprovoked in case of protein C and 5% in the case of protein S. So again, you can see the number of people with an unprovoked clot who have these three significant deficiencies is actually very small. And when you look at the other risk factor, uh, factor V Leiden, the prothrombin gene mutation, you have the opposite evidence. So these are two very common abnormalities within the clotting system, but they're but they're impact is much milder. So if you look at factor V Leiden, factor V Leiden is a mutation within the factor V. And if you go back here, factor V again, very important in terms of why you get a clot. So if you have a mutation, the protein S and the protein C don't work as well. They can't bind to it as well, so they don't work as well. So again, it shifts the clotting system to begin to form a clot more easily, but the shift is much milder. And this is reflected by the fact that it only causes a very mild increased risk of having a clot. And so even though factor V Leiden is very common, in fact, it affects about 5% of the Irish population, the number who actually have a clot is very, very small. And if you ask me, how, where do I come upon factor V Leiden most often? Most often I get asked about it because of relatives abroad getting tested and an, uh, an uncle, an aunt, uh, a cousin, and the person comes in and says, oh my goodness, I have this genetic abnormality, I need to be tested. But I spend most of my time reassuring them and saying, hold on, yes, it's, it's a mutation that can push the clotting system to cause a clot, but it's very, very mild and very, very common. And so, Many people I recommend not to get tested for both the factor V Leiden and the proteome G mutation because I don't believe it will impact on the decision making for that person. And this is really important because when I get contacted by other doctors, it tends to be because they don't know what factor V Leiden or proteome G mutation is actually about. And so they may stop a person having an operation or having a treatment because they think, oh my goodness, they're going to have a clot because they have factor V Leiden or prothrombin gene mutation. But in fact, 
the reality is, is that it's a mild risk factor. And in fact, that person should have that surgery or should have that treatment for the most part because it's a mild risk factor. But the doctor thinks it's more serious and starts uh, putting off surgery or treatments. So in my experience over the last 15 years, many of these mild risk factors should not be tested for because they don't impact how you're going to be managed. And in fact, they may cause you more trouble in terms of misunderstandings about these abnormalities. So what about other tests? Often I'll get people coming back, particularly from Eastern Europe, who say, oh, I was tested for things like homocysteine or high factor eight or, or plasminogen inhibitor. All of these are very, very mild risk factors. And in fact, there's a lot of controversy as to just how powerful they are. What I can say to you is that the impact on your risk from these abnormalities is less than twofold. And certainly in my opinion, and in the opinion of many specialists in this area, they are not worth testing outside of uh, clinical studies or research. So you can see that in thrombophilia testing, really what we're only talking about is uh, 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 antithrombin deficiency, protein S, protein C, factor V Leiden, and prothrombin gene mutation. And even these tests should only be checked out in very, very specific circumstances, which I'm going to talk about. So when should we use these tests? And again, I would say from the beginning, I spent a lot of the last 15 years trying to convince people not to do them because they are not helpful in many situations. So what about if you have a clot associated with a provoking factor? So let's say you break your leg and you have a clot or you have cancer and you develop a clot. Is it worthwhile to check you for an inherited risk factor? And the simple answer is no, because these new factors that have hit you are much more important in causing the clot and they're much more important in predicting the recurrence of a clot rather than testing an inherited risk factor. So the evidence is very clear. If you have a clear reason why you've had a clot, testing for inherited risk factors is not helpful. And certainly I would argue, in fact, it's, it's, it's unhelpful because it will give you information which doesn't help you make decisions and will cause you and your family a great deal of anxiety and stress with no benefit to you in terms of making decisions. What about unprovoked people who get clots out of the blue? In general, I, again, the evidence and the guidelines are no, it's not helpful. And one of my colleagues who I worked with back in Cambridge did a, a, a very important paper back in 2003, confirmed by colleagues in 2005, basically showing that if you come to me and if you've had a clot out of the blue, completely healthy otherwise, if I go and test you for an inherited risk factor and I identify some, some abnormality, can this help me to predict and to decide whether or not you should stay on anticoagulation after three months? The answer is no, based upon these two large studies. It was unhelpful. And this was backed up then by further studies looking at testing asymptomatic Relative. So in other words, you get a clot out of the blue and you have five kids and you say to me, well, look, OK, you're telling me I should stay on blood thinning treatment. What about my daughters and my sons? Should I not get tested genetically to help them? And the evidence is that in most cases, again, it's not helpful. In fact, it's it's stressful, it causes worry and it potentially puts your son or daughter with a label or a diagnosis, which is is going to cause them stress, difficulties, maybe even trouble getting mortgages, things like that. So again, in general, I would say to you that in most cases it is not helpful either for you or for your kids. So what about if you have an unprovoked but you have a family history and here the key is your family history. So where it might be helpful is that if you have a first degree relative who has a similar history of an unprovoked clot under the age of 50. So it may be helpful. So if you come into my clinic this week and you've had a clot in the leg out of the blue and you tell me your mum or dad had a very similar episode or your brother or sister, 
then the chances of picking up a significant deficiency like antithrombin or protein S or protein C becomes higher. And then I may consider testing you. What about rare clots? What if you had a clot in your arm or in your brain? Again, very controversial. Again, to me, it will depend on your family history. So if you have a rare clot in a rare area, such as in the brain or in the abdominal, abdominal veins, we would go through your family history and we would decide based upon your family history whether it's worth testing for the inherited risk factors. What about case finding, which basically means that if we've identified a clot in you, is it worth going and checking other members of the family? And again, if you look at the mild risk factors, particularly for uh, factor V Leiden and Pathroma G mutation, these are so common in the population that in general, they are not worth testing. And that was what the guidelines and the evidence would show. Now, where it may be worth testing is where there's a powerful risk factor which has been identified, such as protein S or protein C deficiency or antithrombin deficiency. So again, the key is not the fact that we've identified it in you, but that potentially in you, there is a very powerful family history. So if you come into me and you've had a, a clot out of the blue and we test you because you have uh, two or three close relatives who also have had a clot and we identify that in you, you have a low protein S or protein C or antithrombin, then I would say to you in that very specific circumstance that it's worthwhile testing perhaps your kids and perhaps other relatives. So it's a very, very focused specific indication to consider testing of asymptomatic people. Again, in most cases, what we'll find is that your family history is unimpressive or when we test you, we don't find a significant abnormality. So what about very specific cases? So what about um, for particularly for uh, daughters that if you have a thrombosis, because for women in particular, making decisions about uh, uh, what is the best contraception, HRT, um, uh, when they're pregnant, all of these are associated in themselves with the higher risk of clots. So is it worthwhile getting tested if you're a young woman whose mom or dad has had a clot? So again, it's, it's very, very specific and it will depend. And what the guidelines show is that in pregnancy or in the using the OCP, etc., that if there is a first degree relative with an unprovoked clot with an identified abnormality, then it may be worthwhile. So again, let me be very clear. If you have your mom or dad who's had a clot unprovoked out of the blue and they've been tested and they've been identified to have a, a genetic abnormality, then it may be worthwhile testing it for you if you're a young woman with regard to making decisions about the oral contraceptive pill or pregnancy or later in life, the HRT. Where it may be less helpful is if that mom or dad has not had testing or has not an identified abnormality. So again, the people where it can be helpful are very, very small in number. It's those people, young women, who have a mom or dad who've had a clot and who have been tested and identified as having an abnormality. They're the people we tend to focus on because for those young women, it would be helpful to know that you have a genetic risk factor to make decisions about uh, contraception and potentially to make decisions about protective treatment during pregnancy. But again, I'd stress that each person and their history and the benefit of testing is quite individual. And again, what we try and do in our clinic, myself and Professor Watts in our clinic, is that we look at it on an individual basis. So if I'm contacted by a GP and they say to me, I have a young woman who has a family history of clotting, should we test them for genetic risk factors? I say to them, look, if the genetic, if the clotting history in the family is something like associated with an accident or surgery or trauma, the straightforward answer is no. If, however, it's unprovoked, no provoking factor for the mom or dad, and particularly if there's a very powerful family history of other family members, then I say 
let's meet with that person and let's have a chat with them. Because what I do not believe should happen is that genetic testing should be done right, left and center without the person being fully aware of the implications of that testing for them personally, for their family and for other factors, as I said, that may be um, uh, health insurance, uh, life assurance. So genetic testing is a serious business and it should only be done when the person is fully informed about what you're going to test. They're fully informed about the tests you're going to do and why you're going to do them. And they're fully informed as to what the implications are of that testing. And again, what I would say to you is that for the most part in the people I meet after I have that discussion with uh, the person, we, t we, we generally don't test at the end of our conversation because to me, it's pretty clear the benefit is not powerful enough to do the testing. So in conclusion, thrombophilia testing should rarely be done. If it's been considered, it should be considered and discussed with an expert in the area who takes through that person's personal history, their family history, and the pros and cons of testing and what exactly testing needs to be done. If after that discussion, the person feels that yes, they'd like to be tested, then what we would usually test is antithrombin, protein C, protein S deficiency, and factor V Leiden for thrombin gene mutation. And again, it's important to remember that the first three are very rare, but powerful risk factors for clots. And the last two are common, but mild risk factors for clots. So when you get the results, it's then important to sit down with the same person or the same expert to say, OK, what are the implications? What's important from my point of view and who else should be tested? So again, the key thing is focused clear testing with full information for the person to know why this is being done. And my final slide is just to tell you a couple of years back, I was fortunate enough to go and work in New Zealand. And when I arrived there, the, the control of testing that we had in Limerick here for the last 10 years, they didn't have. And they were testing 130 people every month for genetic testing for inherited uh, for clot risk in inherited risk factors and that was costing them about three or four hundred thousand a year and i brought i brought in the new guidelines based on the uh, uk guidelines and they went from uh, testing 130 people to testing 10 people within eight weeks and to me it's not about the money saved it's about the fact that there's a hundred 20 people who are not being tested, who don't have to worry about the fact that they're factor five Leiden or a slightly low protein S level, that instead those people did not need to be tested and did not need the stress and the anxiety of a test, which certainly I would believe often is not required based on the current evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was absolutely, I learned so much. I can't believe it. Because I think, you know, you listen to so many of these talks, you think you've heard it all. This is a question actually that comes to us regularly on our social media um, uh, from patients. Like, should I test my daughter, you know, because my daughter might, is, is 16 and might want the pill or want the, you've answered, you've answered it for everybody listening. Um, and I, I do, I relate to the whole health insurance and um, life insurance, actually, life insurance is a big thing on, on, on your mortgage or just on your life. I can't get life insurance. And that, that would be one of the reasons why I wouldn't even want my children tested, because I know that I can protect them by informing them of what increases their risk, the signs to watch for. And they know it's drilled into them that they act fast. If they suspect it, we check. It doesn't matter uh, what everybody thinks we check and that's and to me that's how you protect your children rather than getting one of these tests is that you just keep them really well informed and just for there to be a bit of oversight i think it's nearly a, a gift if if you have experienced a blood clot and survived it you've had the warning and um, so you know that going forward um you know about it and that and that's what saves you that's what protects you if you know about it yeah, I think I think absolutely. I mean, I'm, the thing I always say to people when they come in is that th this this testing is not the important thing. Informing your kids is the important thing. Then they're aware of the fact you've had a clot, 
you know what what it was like um uh, and exactly the symptoms and the signs and 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 there are risks that you might, you know, run the higher the, the situations that are important. So I think you're absolutely right. That's far more important than testing. Yeah. So Claire just came in there and said, um, thank you, Dr. O'Keefe. Great information. It gave me lots to consider with my two daughters. I have protein S deficiency and I've had four blood clots at the age by the age of 37. So it's it's been very helpful. Yeah, so and again, very important. I mean, the, I guess the most important thing that I would stress would be is that every family and individual is different, you know, so this is not a condition in which you can say, oh, well, you know, uh, these people experienced it this way, therefore, you know, I'm going to be similar. So that person's story is a very powerful history. So if, if I met that person in my clinic, I'd be thinking this this is a person and potentially a family where testing would be very important. But again, that is the exception. Far yeah. more common is getting borderline results of protein S with a very little family history. And again, it can cause huge, you know, anxiety, uh, stress in terms of who should be tested, how they should be tested, what's the risks. So, so again, the key is the individual and the family history is vital and then discussing it with somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah, I think um, it also can raise more questions because a lot of times they are inconclusive. Um, you know, it, if somebody's had five blood clots but nothing shows, you nearly feel like a hypochondriac, <laughs> like, you know, what the hell? Yeah. Actually, there hasn't been a test developed to find what that deficiency is. But now you're explaining to me that it doesn't matter if you find out what it is. The point is you're armed with what to do if you get another blood clot. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, obviously it's very frustrating when people come in to meet with me and they say, great stuff. Now, this fella's going to tell me why I got a clot out of the blue. And the first thing I always say is that I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to tell you why you got a clot out of the blue. And I'm not going to be able to possibly do a test to tell you why you had a clot out of the blue. So it's people get very disappointed and frustrated because, of course, nowadays we think we can answer everything. We've got a test. We've got a test for everything, but we, we unfortunately we don't. And and you're absolutely right. Again, it's about common sense and you know your family history, your personal experience, and often using that to dictate the treatment rather than multiple tests. I just have one more question. Um, so can you have like a family history where some of the some of the members of the family have like arterial clots so they're affected by more heart attack that sort of thing and then other other members of the family that are more affected by uh, dvt or pe like is there a link with that or are they two completely separate uh, i think yeah it's a, it's a good question i mean i i think for the most part the the the, the genetic factors are quite separate the only uh, significant would be antithrombin deficiency. So antithrombin deficiency is the most powerful risk factor, but thankfully very rare. That can be associated with arterial and venous clots, both. So that's the one exception. There's always controversy about the others in terms of protein S, protein C. The evidence for those deficiencies in arterial thrombosis is very ropey. And if you look at the British guidelines uh, published 10, 15, 15 years ago now, they did not recommend thrombophilia testing in people, for example, with strokes at a very young age, unless again, there was this very powerful family history uh, in first degree relatives. So I think um, the, the, my answer would be for the most part, it looks as though the genetic factors are quite different, except for antithrombin deficiency. OK, thank you. OK, so there's no further questions there. Thank you so much for that really informative, exceptional okay, Delighted. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Hold on the line there.